Janice Confield, a 46 years old interior designer living in California, has suffered with depression since she was a teenager. She never sought help, help with the condition until she saw a newspaper ad in 1997. The UCLA Neuro Psychiatric Institute was looking for volunteer subjects for a drug trial to test the new antidepressant called Velafac. Schoenfeld, whose depression had escalated to the point where the wife and mother had actually entertained thoughts of suicide, jumped at the chance to be part of the trial. When Schoenfeld arrived at the institute for the first time, a technician hooked her up to an electron encephalography. EEG to monitor and record her brain wave activity for f- about 45 minutes. And not longer after that, Scumfield left with a bottle of pills from the hospital pharmacy. She knew that roughly half of the group of 51 subjects would be getting the drug and half would receive a placebo, although neither she nor the doctors conducting the study had any idea which group she had been randomly assigned to. In fact, no one would know until the study was over, but at the time that hardly mattered to Schoenfeld. She was excited and hopeful, hopeful that after decades of battling clinical depression, condition that would cause her to sometimes suddenly burst into tears for no apparent reason, she might finally be getting help. Schoenfeld agreed to return every week for the entire eight weeks of the study. On each occasion, she'd answer questions about how she was feeling, and several times she sat through Yet another EEG, not long after she started taking her pills, Scumfeld began feeling dramatically better for the first time in her life. Ironically, she also felt nauseated, but that was good news because she knew that nausea was one of the common side effects of the drug being tested. She thought that she surely must have gotten the active drug if she, her depression was lifting and she was also experiencing side effects. Even the nurse she spoke to when she returned every week, she was convinced that Scumfell must be getting the real thing because of the changes she was experiencing. Finally, at the end of the eight-week study, one of the researchers revealed the shocking truth. Schoenfeld, who was no longer suicidal and felt like a new person after taking the pill, had actually been in the placebo group. Schoenfeld was flawed. She was sure the doctor had made a mistake. She simply didn't believe that she could have felt so much better after so many years of suffocating depression simply from taking a bottle of sugar pills, and she'd even gotten the side effects. There must have been a mix-up. She asked the doctor to check the records again. He laughed good-naturedly as he assured her that the bottle she had taken home with her, the bottle that had given Scumfield her lift, life back indeed contained nothing but placebo pills as she sat there in shock the doctor insisted that just because she hadn't been getting any real medication it didn't mean that she had been imagining her depression or her improvement it only meant that whatever had made her feel better wasn't due to Effects of Velafaxin. 
and she wasn't the only one. The study research would soon show that 38% of the placebo group felt better compared to 52% of the group who received the effects. But when the rest of the data came out, it was the researcher's turn to be surprised. The patients like Sconfell, who had improved on the placebos, hadn't just imagined feeling better. They had actually changed their brainwave patterns. The EEG recordings taken so faithfully over the course of the study showed a significant increase in activity in the prefrontal cortex, which in depressed patients typically has very low activity. Thus, the placebo effects was not only altering Scunfield's mind, but also bringing about real physical changes in her biology. In other words, it wasn't just in her mind. It was in her brain. She wasn't just feeling well, she was well. Scunfield literally had a different brain by the end of the study, without taking any drug or doing anything differently, it was her mind that had changed her body. More than a dozen years later, Sconfield still felt much improved. How is it possible that a sugar pill could not? How is it possible that a sugar pill could not only lift the symptoms of? of deep city depression, but also cause bona fide side effects like nausea. And what does it mean that the same inert substance actually has the power to change how brain waves fire, increasing activity in the very part of the brain most affected by depression? Can the sub Objective mind really create those kinds of measurable objective physiological changes? What's going on in the mind and in the body that would allow placebo to so perfectly mimic a real drug in this way? Could the same phenomenon phenomenal healing effect occur not only with chronic mental illness but also with a life-threatening condition such as cancer a miracle cure new now you see it now you don't in 1957 UCLA's psychologist Bruno Klaffer published an article in a peer-reviewed journal telling the story of a man he referred to as Mr. Wright, who had advanced the lymphoma, a cancer of the lymph glands. The man had huge tumors, some as big as an orange in his neck, groin, and arm fit and his cancer was not responding at all to conventional treatments. He lay in his bed for weeks, febrile, gasping for air, completely bedridden. His doctor, Philip West, had given up hope, although Wright himself had not, when Wright found had not. When Wright found out that the hospital where he was being treated in Long Beach, California just happened to be one of 10 hospitals and research centers in the country that were evaluating an experimental drug extracted from horse blood called 
cryobiogen. He got very excited, right on unrelentingly badgered Dr. West for days until the physician agreed to give him some of the new remedy, even though Wright couldn't officially be part of the trial, which required patients to have at least a three-month life expectancy. Wright received his injection of Crebizon on a Friday, and by Monday he was walking around laughing and joking with his nurses. Acting pretty much like a new man, Dr. West reported that the tumors had melted like snowballs on a hot stove. Within three days, the tumors were half their original size. In ten more days, Wright was sent home. He'd been cured. It seemed like a miracle. But two months later, the media reported that the ten trials showed that Crebiogen turned out to be a dude. Once Wright read the news, became fully conscious of the results, and embraced the thought that the drug was useless. He relapsed immediately with his tumors soon returning. Dr. West suspected that Wright's initial positive response was due to the placebo effects, and knowing that his patient was terminal, he figured he had little to lose, and Wright had everything to gain by testing out his theory. So the doctor told Wright not to believe the newspaper reports and that he'd suffered a relapse because the Cribiogen they'd given Wright was found to be part of a bad batch, what Dr. Rest called a new super refined double strength version of the drug was on its way to the hospital and Wright could have it as soon as it arrived in anticipation of being cured. Wright was elated, and a few days later he received the injection, but this time the Shirinji Dr. West used contained no drug, experimental or not. The Shirinji was filled only with distilled water. Again, Wright's tumor magically vanished. He happily returned home and died well for another two months, free of tumors in his body. But then the American Medical Association made the announcement that Cribiogen was indeed worthless. The medical establishment had been duped. The miracle drug turned out to be a hoax, nothing more than mineral oil containing a simple amino acid. The manufacturers were eventually indicted. Upon hearing the news, Wright relapsed a final time, no longer believing in the possibility of health. He returned to the hospital, hopeless, and two days later was dead. Is it possible that Wright somehow changed his state of being, not once but twice, to that of a man who simply didn't have cancer in a matter of days? Did his body then automatically respond to a new mind? And could he have changed his state back to that of man with cancer once? He heard the drug was purported to be worthless, with his body creating exactly the same chemistry and returning to the familiar second condition. Is it possible to achieve such a new biochemical state not only when taking a pill 
or getting a shot, but also when undergoing something as invasive as surgery? The knee surgery that never happened. In 1996, orthopedic surgeon Bruce Mosley, then of the Baylor College of Medicine and one of Houston's leading experts in orthopedic sports medicine, published a trial study based on his experience with 10 volunteers, all men who had served in the military and suffered from arthritis of the knee due to the severity of their conditions many of these men had a noticeable limp walked with a cane or needed some type of assistance to get around the study was designed to look at arthroscopic surgery a popular surgery that involved arthroscopic surgery, a popular surgery that involved anesthetizing the patient before making a small incision to insert a fiber optic instrument called an arthroscope, which the surgeon would used to get a good look at the patient's joint. In the surgery, the doctor would then scrape and rinse the joint to remove any fragments of uh, degenerated cartilage that were thought to be the cause of the inflammation and pain. At the time, about three quarters of a million patients received the surgery every year. In Dr. Mosley's study, two of the ten men were to be given the standard surgery called a debridement, where the surgeon scrapes strands of cartilage from the knee joint. Three of them were to receive a procedure called a levage where high pressured water is injected through the knee joint, rinsing and flushing out the decayed arthritic material, and five of them would receive a sham surgery in which Dr. Mosley would deftly slice through their skin with a scalpel and then just to sew them back up again without performing any medical procedure at all. For those five men, there would be no arthroscope, no scraping of the joint, no removal of bone fragments, and no washing, just an incisions and then stitches. The start of each of the ten procedures were exact was exactly the same. The patient was wheeled into the operating room and given general anesthesia while Dr. Mosley uh, scrubbed up. Once the surgeon entered the operating theater, he would find a sealed envelope waiting for the him that would tell him which of the three groups the patient on the table had been randomly assigned to. Dr. Mosley would have no idea what the envelope contained until he actually ripped it open. After the surgery, all 10 of the patients in the study reported greater mobility and less pain. In fact, the man who received pretend surgery did 
just as well as those who received debridement or Levigi surgery. There was no difference in the result. Even six months later and six years later, when two of the men who received, received the placebo surgery were interviewed, they reported that they were still walking normally, without pain and had greater range of motion. They said that they could now perform all the everyday activities that they had, hadn't been able to do before the surgery. Six years earlier, the men felt as though they, they regained their lives. Fascinated by the results, Dr. Mosley published another study in 2002 involving 180 patients who were followed for two years after their surgeries. Again, all three groups improved with patients beginning to walk without pain or limping immediately after the surgery. But again, neither of the two groups who actually had the surgery improved any more than the patients who received the placebo surgery and this held true even after two years and this held true even after two years. Could it be possible that these patients got better simply because they had faith and belief in the healing power of the surgeon? the hospital, and even in the gleaming modern operating room itself, did they somehow envision a life with a fully healed knee, simply surrender to that possible outcome, and then literally walked right into it? Was Dr. Mosley, in fact, nothing more than a modern day witch doctor in a white lab coat and is it possible to attain the same degree of healing when facing something more threatening maybe something as serious as heart surgery